Um, Henry the Fourth, Part One. Notice how it opens. Henry the Fourth used to be Bolingbroke, now just King. Had, opens the play with a fairly long speech, thirty plus lines, that is telling us about what the current state is in England. That is, what is what's the current atmosphere, what is going on politically, what is just how everybody kind of feels for the moment. So shaken as we are, so wan with care, find we a time for fretted peace to pant. We're out of breath, and we have to find a moment of peace just to breathe heavily, he says. And breathe short-winded accents of new broils to be commenced in strands of far remote. He's talking about starting wars, or getting involved in wars, on foreign lands. Okay? No more the thirsty entrance of this soil shall daub her lips with her own children's blood. We've put an end to the Civil War. That is, the people who supported Richard, they're all put down, not killed, but that conflict has ended, okay? Those opposed eyes, which like the meteors of a troubled heaven, all of one nature, of one substance bred, did lately meet in the intestine shock and furious clothes of civil butchery, that is, opposing eyes of the opposing forces, English fighting against English, okay? Shall now in mutual will be seeming ranks march all one way and be no more opposed against acquaintance, kindred, and allies. So the people that were fighting against each other are now all going to be marshaled to fight a common, single, foreign foe. Therefore, friends, as far as to the sepulcher of Christ, whose soldier now under whose blessed cross we are impressive and engaged to fight, forthwith the power of English shall we levy, whose arms were molded in their mother's womb to chase these pagans in those holy fields, over whose acres walk those blessed feet, which 1,400 years ago were nailed for our advantage to the bitter cross. But this our purpose now is 12 months old. And bootless tis to tell you we will go, therefore we meet not now. That is, I've been intending to do this for how long? A year has passed since Richard's death. Okay? So why hasn't he done it yet? Because of the Civil War. Because of the conflict among the English. But he says... It's bootless now to tell you we will go. That's not why we're meeting now. So he gives this big long speech about how we need to go fight foreigners, okay? But there's something else that we're meeting to discuss. So let me hear of you, my gentle cousin Westmoreland, what yesterday night our council did decree in forwarding this dear expedience, okay? So Westmoreland comes in. And what information does he bring? Yesternight, a post from Wales loaded with heavy news, whose worst was that the noble Mortimer, leading the men of Herefordshire to fight against the irregular and wild Glendower. Glendower is a famous captain, general, leader, whatever you want to call him, of the Welsh. Real character, real person, okay? So, Mortimer, while leading the troops of Herefordshire, was captured by Glendower. Was by the rude hands of that Welshman taken, a thousand of his people butchered. I need to pause for a moment. Turn back to... to the um, genealogy on page A72 in the back. Now, if you look at that genealogy of the Yorkist kings, and I'm, I'm not saying that you have to look, turn back to it. I'm just making sure I've got this right. Yeah. There's a bunch of Mortimers. So you got to get the right one in mind. So the Yorkist kings. The Yorkist kings all descend, as do the Lancastrian kings, from Edward III. Okay. So, you have Edward III, 
married Philip of Hino, okay, and go down to um, beneath that first line, Philippa married Edmund Mortimer, the Earl of March, third Earl of March, 1351 to 81. They then had several children. Roger Mortimer, fourth Earl of March, who married Eleanor Holland, and they had Edmund Mortimer, the fifth Earl of March. That's the Mortimer that's being talked about. Okay, This is the Mortimer that's been captured by Glendower. So, notice his lineage. Who's he related to? King Edward III. In other words, he has what? A claim to the throne. A direct claim to the throne. Okay? Does Bolingbroke have a direct claim to the throne? Yes, he does. Okay? But Bolingbroke's direct claim um, to the throne. And, and here's something I'm not quite sure. I don't quite understand exactly how the the genealogy is, is drawn out. But if you go back to the top line of, of all the people who descend from Edward III, beginning with Edward on the left and William Lionel, and then you have an M, period, and a line down. Philippa, who then marries Edmund Mortimer. I think by having the M, and I'm not sure, the M should mean marriage, but it's not Lionel. So I'm guessing maybe he had a daughter named Philippa. She marries Edmund Mortimer. Notice, Philippa there, if I'm reading this correctly, is older than John of Gaunt. Okay? Because Bolingbroke slash Henry IV descends from John of Gaunt. So Mortimer has a claim to the throne. Is his claim greater than Henry IV's? Is part of my question. Okay? Say that again, but okay, louder. Well, it, actually, you could, because princesses did become queens. Um, I just, I don't know the medieval laws of primogeniture well enough to, and I, again, I'm not quite sure about how this is um, portrayed. Anyways, this is the Mortimer being discussed. So, so this Mortimer has has a, a claim to the throne, okay? So keep that in mind. Mortimer's been captured now by Glendower, okay? And a thousand of his people of the Herefordshire army or militia have been butchered. King, hmm, it seems that the tidings of this broil break off our business for the Holy Land, okay? So cancel the pilgrimage slash crusade we got to take care of Glendower, Westmoreland. Oh, that's not the only news. So, there in London, I believe, yeah, the Royal Court, there in London, so here's London down here. Where's Wales? Over here, okay, to the west. So then Westmoreland says, that, that's not all. Came from the north, and thus it did a port. What came from the north? More uneven and unwelcome news. Came from the north, and thus it did import. On Holy Rood Day, the gallant Hotspur there, young Harry Percy, and brave Archibald, that ever valiant and approved Scot, at Holmden met, where they did spend a sad and bloody hour, as by discharge of their artillery in shape of likelihood the news was told. Okay, and what do we hear? For he that brought them in the very heat and pride of their contingent to take horse, uncertain at the issue anyway. This is the news. I don't know who won. Did Harry win, or did Archibald the Scot? <coughs> so the king says, well, Sir Walter Blunt just arrived. He has news. And here's the news that the king says Blunt brought. The Earl of Douglas is discomfited. 
And, and this guy's never named other than the Douglas. Okay? By putting that the in front, what are we meant to infer from that? Louder? He's the only one. Okay, the, the Douglas is a title. Okay, the Earl of Douglas is like a place. Okay. But by calling him the Douglas, he's kind of setting him up as this guy is the greatest warrior there is. So if you can capture the Douglas, then that says something about your own military prowess. So the Earl of Douglas is discomfited. He's no longer comfortable. How so? 10,000 bold Scots, two and 20 knights, balked in their own blood, did Sir Walter see on Holmden's plains. Of prisoners, Hotspur took. Mordrake, Earl of Fife, eldest son to beaten Douglas. So he took Douglas and his son. And the Earl of Athol, Murray, Angus, and Mintaith. And is not this an honorable spoil, a gallant prize? Is it not? Hotspur did this. Now, not Hotspur single-handedly, but Hotspur with his troops. Okay? Now, bear in mind, historically, Hotspur, Harry Percy, is the same age as Henry Bolingbroke, Henry IV. But that doesn't fit Shakespeare's purposes. He needs Hotspur to be the, the age of Henry's son. Because he needs a foil for Hal. He needs somebody to set Hal off against that will show Hal's true colors later on. He also needs somebody to show off Hal against at the beginning of the play to show how poorly Hal is thought of in the beginning of the play. Hal, Prince Henry. Okay? So... Westmoreland says, yeah, man, that's a conquest. What a conquest to boast of. Henry's not just the king. is isn't just setting this up to go, way to go, Hotspur. He's building to something. And yea, there thou makest me sad, and makest me sin in envy, that my lord Northumberland should be the father to so blessed a son. When was the last time we heard the king talk about his son? Go back for a moment. Richard III, 2, Act 5, Scene 3. Can no man tell me of my unthrifty son? Haven't seen him for three months. Look at London. Go to the whorehouses. You'll probably find him there. A son, notice, who is the theme of honor's tongue. So when honor speaks, what does honor say? Hotspur, Hotspur, Hotspur. He's saying Hotspur is the very model of honor. Amongst a grove, the very straightest plant, who is sweet fortune's minion and her pride. Now, if you're fortune's minion and her pride, then what is that? How does that mean life is going for you? Yeah, very well. You are at the absolute top. I mean, things are just going, nothing goes bad. Whilst I, so Northumberland has this kind of son, and it's really cool if you ever go to Annet Castle in, in Northumbria today, which is the ancestral home of the Percy family, once you, you go through the welcoming stuff, you walk into the courtyard and there's this big, massive bronze sculpture of Harry Percy on horseback, Hotspur, okay? Whilst I, by looking on the praise of him, see riot and dishonor stain the brow of my young Harry. 
Riot, your gloss tells you. Debauchery. So, honor says, vice says, Harry, Harry, Harry. Oh, that it could be proved that some night tripping fairy had exchanged in cradle claws our children where they lay. In other words, could it be proved what? My Harry is a changeling. My Harry is actually supposed to be Northumberland's Harry. And Northumberland's Harry is really my Harry. And called mine Percy his Plantagenet. Now, stop and think about this for a moment. This is a father saying, I wish my son weren't my son. Kind of effect, especially if the son knows that or hears that. What kind of effect does that have? Then would I have his Harry and he mine. What? Let him from my thoughts. I'm not going to think about Harry. So what think you, cuz, of this young Percy's pride? The prisoners which he and his adventure hath surprised to his own use he keeps. So he praises Hotspur. Right? And then after meditating on his own worthless son for a moment, it's not his only son, by the way. He has another one, John, Duke of Lancaster. He goes back to Hotspur and says, what about it? Well, if he's the very theme of honor's tongue, then what the king says about Hotspur next kind of undercuts this. The prisoners which he in this adventure hath surprised to his own use, he keeps and sends me word I shall have none but more day. Okay. As with kind of Anglo-Saxon period, you got to understand the the medieval power structure. You've got the king at top, right? Beneath the king, you have whatever you want to call them. Barons, dukes, earls, etc. And those are different levels for different kind of positions. But they're essentially all knights, okay? Actually, nobles, just regular knights down beneath. But all of these people down beneath the king do what to the king? They swear something. An oath of fealty, homage, okay? homage. They swear an oath of fealty. If you're familiar with the King Arthur stories, every Pentecost, the, the knights of the, of the uh, round table gather together and they swear the Pentecost oath, which is an oath to Arthur and to the round table to do certain things. Okay? That's the literary form of the real historical form. The historical form is that everybody was a vassal to somebody higher up than them, except for you know, the people of the quote-unquote emerging middle class. Uh, shopkeepers, bartenders, etc. They weren't necessarily vassals to somebody else. But when you're in the military like this, you were. So down at the very bottom of this would be the page. Right? The guy who's just learning how to be a knight. What does he do? He shines his master's arm, polishes his master's armor, cleans his boots, etc., etc. Above the page, you have the squire. Above the squire, you have the knight. Above the knight, you have the knight's lord. Above the knight's lord, he might have another lord, all the way up to eventually the king. Okay? So, when Hotspur captures enemy soldiers of the king, whose prisoners are they, in theory? They're the king's. So he ought to deliver them to the king. And what did he say? I give you one. You get more date. Notice, you don't get the Douglas. What does that imply? Does Henry really? 
defiance. Does Henry really, really, really run? Man, can't talk this morning. That's what happens when you don't have any coffee. Does uh, the king really want Hotspur to have these strong, powerful knights prisoners with him. No, he doesn't. All right? Westmoreland, this is his uncle's teaching. This is because of his uncle, Worcester. It's his uncle that put him up to this. Okay? Malevolent to you in all aspects, which makes him prune himself and bristle up. King, well, I've sent for him to answer this. That is, Hotspur's got to come before me, because when the king says, come to London, you come, because if you don't come, then that's not subtle defiance, that's open defiance, and that's cause for your death. Okay? He says, and for this cause, while we must neglect our holy purpose, Jerusalem, cousin, cousin on Wednesday next, we'll hold a council. So, the play opens with a king with his council of advisors of sorts, right? Look at the next scene. We have another council of sorts. And Shakespeare does this repeatedly throughout this play. Kingly council, whorehouse council, okay? Falstaff comes in. Now, do we know anything about Sir John Falstaff at this point in the play? Have we been introduced to him earlier or in... Richard II. No, we have not. This is our first indication. Okay? We're not given a physical description of him in terms of um, play directions and such. So, full stuff. Now, Hal, what time of day is it, lad? Okay, notice, Prince of Wales. And he calls him Hal. Hal's a familiar form. My full name's Theodore. Ted is a familiar form. If I were Theodore, Prince of Wales, then Falstaff should be calling me either Your Highness <laughs> or by the full name. Thou art so fat-witted with drinking of old sack and unbuttoning thee after supper and sleeping upon benches after noon that thou hast forgotten to demand that truly which thou wouldst truly know. So how's given us some descriptions of Falstaff? Plus, we see him now. What a devil hast thou to do with the time of the day? Why does Hal ask this? Let me use a different example. You're a 30, 35-year-old, unemployed white male. You live with your parents in their basement. You play video games all day long. What does it matter to you what time of day it is? That's Hal's point. What has he just said Falstaff does? Drinks and eats all day. He has to unbutton his clothes after dinner because he eats so much. He sleeps on the benches until noon. What do you care what time of the day it is? Unless hours were cups of sack. And men as capons, like chicken legs. And clocks the tongues of bods. And dials the dial dials the signs of leaping houses and the blessed sun itself, leaping houses, houses of prostitution. Why? Because you leap over. We could go into Shakespeare's sexual body. And the blessed sun himself, a fair hot witch, and flame cuff for taffeta. I see no reason why thou shouldst be so superfluous to demand the time of day. <laughs> you come near me now, Hal. In other words, that's a pretty good read of my character, Hal. <laughs> good job. For we that take purses go by the moon and the seven stars, the Pleiades. What does he mean, we that take purses? Remember what Richard, excuse me, what Henry said in Act 5, Scene 3, Richard II? What else? They're cut purses. They're highway robbers. They beat the night watch. All right? So, he says... And I pray thee, sweet wag, when thou art king, line 16, as God save thy grace, majesty, I should say, God save thy majesty, 
Why? Because thy grace is a title reserved for a religious Lord. <coughs> for grace thou wilt have none. So he puns on that. None? No, none. Well, how so? So they go on to talk. I'm going to skip a bunch of it. And we see pawns, um, pawns come in, and the prince talks with him. So they plan what? In Act 1, Scene 2. I keep forgetting, I don't have any water. I can't drink any because I'm surgeon. Um, a joke? A robbery. They're planning a robbery. Okay. So they all leave. They, Falstaff, Pawns, etc. And Hal gets a soliloquy. I haven't pulled, I should have pulled it up on the computer. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty sure this is on YouTube. Tom Hiddleston's version of this, playing Hal, and the way he does the soliloquy is pretty, pretty good. Try and, I'll see if I can find it um, and post it to the class. So they all leave. And in, in fact, there is a, a um, clip on YouTube. And it's of several people doing the soliloquy. So that you get several different actors' kind of interpretations of how it ought to be done. It's pretty interesting. I know you all. And will a while, will a while uphold the unyoked humor of your idleness. Now, Shakespeare writes in what kind of meter? Iambic pentameter. So does that mean when you are reading Shakespeare or when you're acting Shakespeare, it always has to be da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da. No. No. Because if it is, it will sound stilted. It won't sound natural. He uses iambic pentameter because iambic pentameter is almost the natural English rhythm of speech. Okay? So, is it, I know you all and will a while uphold? No. In that first half of the line, I know you all, where's the real emphasis? It's on no. I know you all. And will a while uphold the unyoked humor of your idleness. Notice, your idleness. What about himself? Yet herein will I imitate the sun, who doth permit the base contagious clouds to smother up his beauty from the world, that when he please again to be himself, being wanted, he may be more wondered at by breaking through the foul and ugly mists of vapors that did seem to strangle him. So how is telling us what about himself? Louder. Okay, what else? How is he biding his time? Why does he say, I will imitate the sun? By saying, I will imitate the sun, how is he saying, I will be what? I will be the sun. Okay, look outside today, you don't see the sun. Why? Because of the base contagious clouds. That are doing what? Smothering up his beauty from the world. But what happens when those clouds disappear and the sun shines? Our eyes are drawn to it. We're mesmerized by it. That's what Hal is saying. What are the base contagious clouds? Smothering up his beauty from the world. His friends. Or his Friends. Are they really his friends? Okay. Oh, does he? Does he? 
I, I like that. Does he take ownership of his own behavior? Or is he saying it's all their fault? So look at the rest of the speech. That when he pleads again to be himself, when the son pleases again to be himself, being wanted, he may be more wondered at by breaking through the foul and ugly mists. Being wanted. When the people want to see the sun, and the, it finally gets enough that the sun breaks through, again, Hal says, I'm going to imitate the sun. So, when the people want what? To see the real me. What will I do? I'll show them the real me. If all the year we're playing holidays, to sport would be as tedious as to work. Right? What's, what's he saying by that? If every day, 365 days a year, was vacation, then the word vacation would have no meaning. All right? To sport would be as tedious as to work. It, it would all be the same. As Shakespeare says, a rose by any other name, it's still a rose. But when they seldom come, right? When holidays seldom come, then what? They wished for come. That is, when they do come, oh, then we go into them full bore. We just love and kind of suck out the marrow of that time. And nothing pleases but rare accidents. So, so, so he's created a simile. When this loose behavior I throw off. Now, that's not, it seems to me that he is telling us he is owning his behavior. He's, he's saying, yeah, I'm acting loose, but I'm acting. And pay the debt I never promise it. What debt is that? be the king or to be the prince all right why did he never promise it, it? he was born into it he had no choice in the matter by how much better than my word i am what speaks louder actions or words actions do by so much shall i falsify men's hopes and like bright metal on a sullen ground, my, it's not an accidental term that Shakespeare chooses here. Reformation. Because the Protestant Reformation began about 70 years, 70, years, 70, 80 to, year, 70 to 80 years before this play is written. My Reformation glittering o'er my fault shall show more goodly and attract more eyes than that which hath no foil to set it off. People will see me in such a new light that what will happen to their previous thoughts of me? Let's use some current political context. When, when Trump was still running for president, he said, you know, oh yeah, I'll act president. I'll be a so presidential. You... No other president will be as presidential as I am. Hasn't done it, right? Have we ever already? Trump lovers, Trump haters would all say, hasn't done it. Imagine for a moment, I know it's impossible, but imagine for a moment he did do that. Imagine for a moment he became presidential like JFK, Reagan, FDR kind of presidential. Stopped tweeting, stopped calling people dummies, stopped saying, you know, not good bad, you know, single syllable sentences, you know, and started speaking like Richard II. What would we think? It was all an act. It was all an act. We have an example, by the way, of that in a president, whether you're aware of it or not. George W. Bush acted like a dunce. The guy really wasn't, slash isn't. He really actually Pretty high IQ, okay? 
Again, whatever one thinks of them. I'll so offend. Now that sounds like our current president. I'll so offend to make offense a skill. That is, people are going to be studying. This is how you offend somebody. Why? Redeeming time when men think least I will. Okay, so juxtapose this speech with the king's speech about his son. And what's it tell us? Okay. What else does it tell us? I mean, I think you're definitely right. Father thinks he's worthless. Pretty good acting, then. Notice, Dad's not in on this. Okay. Who is how closer to his father or Falstaff? It appears to be Falstaff. So the king comes in, and we're told. He's pretty upset. <laughs> My blood hath been too cold and temperate, unapt to stir at these indignities, and you have found me, for accordingly you tread upon my patience. Who has he come in with? Northumberland, Worcester, Hotspur, Blunt, and others. Well, those first three, they're not getting along so well with the king. Okay? So, The king tells, Worcester starts to talk, Northumberland says, my lord, and the king cuts him off. Worcester, get thee gone, for I do see danger and disobedience in thine eye. I look at you, and what do I see? Treachery. Plotting. Leave. Worcester leaves, and he goes, you were about to speak? <laughs> because the king cut him off. Northumberland, yea, my good lord. Those prisoners in your highness's name demanded, which Harry Percy here at Homden took, were, as he says, not with such strength denied as is delivered to your majesty. Either envy, therefore, or Miss Pridgen is guilty of this fault. Not my son. Hotspur then addresses the king. My liege, I did deny no prisoners. But I remember when the fight was done, when I was dry with rage, extreme toil, breathless and faint, leaning upon my sword, there came a certain lord. So what's the picture Hotspur's just told us? I defeated these guys in battle. I'm sitting there, leaning on my sword, panting, out of breath, blood on me. And describe the guy who comes up to him and demands to... The prisoners of him. There came a certain lord, neat and trimly dressed. This guy's dressed in a $5,000 suit, in other words. Fresh as a bridegroom, his chin new reaped, recently shaved, showed like a stubble land at harvest home. He was perfumed like a milliner. Got a gloss down there. Dealer in fancy articles, such as gloves and hats. So he's got a lot of cologne on. Lost my place. And twitched his finger in his thumb, he held a pouncet box, which ever, a snuff box. Every now and then he's going, and he's probably got a little, you know, handkerchief hanging half out of his, okay? Meanwhile, Hotspur is over there, dead tired, dead bodies around him, blood and gore on him, leaning on his sword because he can't stand up entirely of his own strength because he's so tired. And this guy goes, mm -mm, Sir, Mr. Hotspur, can I have those prisoners, please? Please deliver them to He questioned me amongst the rest demanded my prisoners on your majesty's behalf. I then, all smarting with my wounds being cold, to be so pestered with a popinjay 
Out of my grief and my impatience, anger neglectingly, I don't know what. He's saying, I don't know what I said. I flew off at the handle. I was angry. Okay? Blunt. Okay. Now, who is blunt to the king? Counselor, advisor, friend. <clears throat> We're going to see later on in the play, there's going to be a battle. Blunt impersonates the king. Why? To draw attention away from the king. Blunt. The circumstance considered, good my lord, whatever Lord Harry Percy then had said to such a person in such a place at such a time, I, I think we should not pay any attention to that. King. Why yet he doth deny his prisoners. King's answer is kind of like, okay, I'll give you that. But you still now deny them. But with proviso and exception that we at our own charge shall ransom straight his brother-in-law, the foolish Mortimer. He'll give me his prisoners if I pay the ransom for Mortimer. Who on my soul hath willfully betrayed the lives of those he did lead to fight against that great magician damned of Glendower, whose daughter, as we hear, that Earl of March hath lately married. Yeah, well, word has reached me that Mortimer, the Earl of March, after he was captured by Glendower, married Glendower's daughter. In other words, maybe he didn't put up such a strong fight against him after all. And the thousands that died as a result, they're Mortimer's fault. Shall our coffers then be empty to redeem a... See, and it's real dangerous when you throw this word around in 14th century early 15th century England. Traitor. Because we, we have the phrase, them's fighting words. That doesn't mean 2018 what it meant then. Because you throw the word traitor on, as we saw in the previous play, and what do men start doing? Start whipping off their gauges and throwing them on the ground so you have that whole pile of gauntlets, you know? That's how lots of people die. Shall we buy treason and indent with fears when they have lost and forfeited themselves? No, let them starve. He says, he finishes his speech. I shall never hold that man, my friend, whose tongue shall ask me for one penny cost to ransom home, revolted Mortimer. Okay, now remember Hotspur is what? The theme of honor's tongue. Revolted Mortimer? He never did fall off my sovereign liege, but by the chance of war, to prove that true, needs no more but one tongue for all those wounds, blah, 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 blah. Okay? He finished his speech. Nor never could the noble Mortimer receive so many and all willingly, that is, wounds. Let not him be slandered with revolt. He's just accused the king of slander. Thou dost belie him, Percy. He never did encounter with Glendale. I tell thee, he durst as well have met the devil alone as Glendower for an enemy. King saying, he didn't fight him. Okay. What do both sides in this little argument lack? What do neither of them have? Louder? Proof! Exactly! Do we have an eyewitness? Shakespeare loves this idea of witness. Okay? We're going to see it in Hamlet, especially at the end of the play. I was talking about this in my intro to lit course yesterday. Hamlet's going to end with Hamlet telling Horatio, Horatio, you've got to live, because Horatio wants to drink the poison and die with Hamlet after a good Roman would. He says, no, you've got to live for one reason. You've got to tell my story aright. You have to go out to the dissatisfied. Who are the dissatisfied? All the people who weren't present at the mass killing in the hall, who didn't see why Hamlet killed Claudius, how Claudius killed Gertrude accidentally, how Claudius and Laertes plotted against Hamlet. He said, if you don't go out there and tell them what's going to happen, Hamlet killed the king. 
says, you got to tell the story away. Why? Horatio's eyewitness account. Okay? So, it didn't happen, the king says. Art thou not ashamed? It's our hints for it. From now and evermore, don't talk about Mortimer in my presence. Okay? I don't want to hear the name. Send me your prisoners with speediest means, or you shall hear in such a kind from me as will displease you. Now that's a nice, subtle threat. <laughs> Send me your prisoners, or else. The king leaves. And if the devil come in war for them, I will not send them. What does that tell us about Hotspur? Just that one little line and a half. And if the devil come, I will not send them. Oh, does he have a temper. He flies off at the handle. Okay? He is rash. He is impetuous. Especially when honor is at stake. Right? Hamlet says, real briefly, In Act 5, he's talking to Horatio, and says, Talks about people will find honor or find argument in a straw when honor is at stake. Oh, I can't find it. We'll talk about it later. So, Northumberland. What? Drunk with collar, collar, anger. Stay in pause. Here comes your uncle, Hotspur. Speak of Mortimer? Now his father just told him, cool it. And he just what? It's like the bellows on a, on a forge. He just he keeps getting hotter and hotter and hotter. Okay? So they keep talking, and we see Northumberland and Worcester Talk with Hotspur, and let's see. <coughs> Hotspur says, line 158. No, let me back up. Yeah, I got to do that part. Um, 145. Worcester says, Was not he, Mortimer, Earl of March, proclaimed by Richard that dead is the next of blood? Northumberland, he was. I heard the proclamation. And th then it was when the unhappy king, whose wrongs in us God pardon. Why? What were the wrongs in us? Um, possibly. Back that up just a little bit. Not his death. His, de his being deposed. Right? Because who stood by the side Bolingbroke? Northumberland. He landed in Northumberland's land. Okay? So he says, did set forth upon his Irish expedition. Northumberland says, before Richard left for Ireland, he said, anything happens to me, Mortimer should be the next king. 
from whence he intercepted did return to be deposed and shortly murdered. Worcester. And for his death, we in the world's wide mouth live scandalized and foully spoken of. In other words, people say, we had a hand in that. Why? Because everybody who had a hand in Bolingbroke's ascension to the throne is guilty by what? Association. Hotspur. Well, stop, stop. Richard proclaimed my brother Edmund Mortimer heir to the crown, not literal brother, kind of brother in arms. He did. Myself did hear it. Nay, then I cannot blame his cousin King that wished him on the barren mountain starve. Oh, I get it now. That's why the king won't bring him back. But shall it be that you shall set the crown upon the head of this forgetful man, and for his sake wear the detested blot of murderous subornation? Shall it be that you a world of curses undergo, being the agents or base second means, the cords of the latter or the hangman rather? It's your fault he's king. Was Harry Percy not active at all in Richard II? Well, he was there. Oh, pardon me that I descend so low to show the line and the predicament wherein you range under this subtle king. He's trying to spur them to action. Okay? But he's also saying, the predicament we find ourselves in is your fault. You have to solve the problem. Did men of your nobility and power to gauge them both in an unjust behalf, as both of you, God pardon it, have done to put down Richard that sweet, lovely rose and plant this thorn, this canker, bowling brook? Well, was Richard a sweet, lovely rose in the previous play? Or was there some rot at the root of that rose already? And shall it in more shame be further spoken that you were fooled, discarded, and shook off by him for these shames ye underwent? In other words, you helped him to the crown, and now what? Yeah, you regret it? He gives you scraps from the table. He says, no. Yet time serves, line 180, wherein you may redeem your banished honors and restore yourselves into the good thoughts of the world again. How? Revenge the jeering and disdained contempt of this proud king who studies day and night to answer all the debt he owes to you, even with the bloody payment of your debts. Hotspur says, King Henry IV is every day and night plotting how to get rid of you. He's saying, he's a Machiavelli. You know, Machiavelli famously asked, is it better to be loved or feared? And he answered, feared. Okay. Worcester, shh, stop. Hotspur goes on. Northumberland, we can't shut him up when he's like this. You, you just have to let him run his course. Okay? So, they continue talking. Hotspur says, I'm going to keep my prisoners. I'm not going to give them back to the king. I'll keep them all, 213. By God, he shall not have a scout of them. No, if a scout would save his soul, he shall not. I'll keep them by his, by this hand. So, 2-1. We have a carrier come in with a lantern in his hand. And we have Gad's Hill come in, and the Chamberlain. Uh, go to 2-2. Two, two. The Prince, Twans, Pito, and Bardolf all enter. Okay. Falstaff comes in. And what does... I don't want to spend a lot of time. Um, what does the prince in pawns do to the others? Okay, they rob them, but what else? This is the Gads Hill robbery, okay? Falstaff and the others rob Gadshill and the Chamberlain. 
and then the prince and pawns rob Falstaff. Okay. Two against Falstaff, Pito, Bardolph, three. Two against three or so. So go to Act Two, Scene Three. Hotspur comes in and he goes and talks to his wife. <coughs> he has a big long speech, which I'm going to skip. And Lady Percy says, Oh my good lord, why are you thus alone? For what offense have I this fortnight been a banished woman from my Harry's bed? Tell me, sweet lord, what is it that takes from thee thy stomach pleasure and thy golden sleep? Why dost thou bend thine eyes upon the earth and start so often when thou sitst alone? She's, what's wrong with you? Oh, what portents are these? Line 61. Some heavy business hath my lord in hand, and I must know it, else he loves me not. She says, you're planning something. What is it? If you don't tell me, then you don't love me. What ho? Servant comes in. Notice, completely ignores her. Okay. Hear you, my lord. What sayest thou, my lady? What is it carries away? Why, my horse, my love, my horse. She goes, no, seriously. I'll know your business, Harry, that I will. I fear my brother Mortimer to stir about his title and sit for you to line his enterprise. You're going to go help Mortimer, aren't you? Now, what does she know that that is equivalent to? Treason. Come, come, you paraquito, answer me directly under this question. He says, away, you trifler. Love? I love thee not. I care not for thee, Kate. This is no world to play with mammoths and to tilt with lips. We must have bloody noses and cracked crowns. I can't be f busied with women. I gotta go kill people. Okay. What wouldst thou have with me, he asks. Do you not love me? Do you not indeed? Well, do not then, for since you love me not, I will not love myself. Now, that's a threat. Well, if you're not gonna love me, then I'm not gonna love myself. Come, you want to see me ride? I love thee infinitely, but hark you, Kate, I must not have you henceforth question me whither I go and no reason whereabout. Whither I must, I must, and to conclude this evening, I leave you gentle Kate. So he doesn't tell her why he goes, but he does tell her, I love you, okay? Thou wilt not utter what thou dost not know, and so far will I trust thee, gentle Kate. You can't give away me if you don't know where I'm going, and that's how far I'm going to trust you. Now, is this just utter cynicism on Hotspur's, Hotspur's part? Or is this also protective? If I don't tell you, they can't harm you. Okay. Back to the robbers. So, they get at the um, tavern. And the prince says, um, about line 88, Falstaff and the rest of the thieves are at the door. Shall we be married? Pawn says, yes, yes we, should. yes, we should. Okay. And then the prince says, about 190, uh, excuse me, 98. Ever this fellow should have fewer words than a parrot, and yet the son of a woman. His industry is upstairs and downstairs. His eloquence, the parcel of a reckoning. I am not yet of Percy's mind. Okay, he's talking about Hotspur. The Hotspur of the North, he that kills me some six or seven dozen of Scots at a breakfast. And now, obviously, how is being what towards Hotspur? He's being facetious. He's mocking him. I mean, before he eats breakfast, he eats, he kills six or seven dozen Scots. Washes his hands, says to his wife, fie upon this quiet life. Well, what did we just see with Hotspur? Kate's gone, Harry, come on, let's go to bed. It's been two weeks. And he's gone, I can't tell with mammoths and lips and stuff. Let's, I gotta go kill. 
Hal's reading of Hotspur is pretty close. Fly upon this quiet life. I want work. Oh, my sweet Harry, says she. How many hast thou killed today? Give my roan horse a drench, says he. Answers some 14 hour later. Now, Shakespeare's using this scene to cast the previous scene in a comedic light. The previous scene isn't meant to be comedic. But this is Hal making fun of Hotspur's notion of honor. Hal is saying Hotspur's notion of honor is just kill as many as you can. Just get the body count. Okay? So then we see Falstaff and the others come in. And what do we hear? They talked about the robbery, right? And what do we hear Falstaff say about the robbery? How many were involved? A dozen or more that came upon them. And he fought off. And it keeps getting more and more and more. We get towards the end of that scene, or maybe midway through it, on page 804 in this edition, <coughs> in, um, this is Act 2, Scene 4, let's see here, line... Line 416, Hal says to Falstaff, um, hold on a second. Just before then, they kind of put on, it's, it's not really putting on a play, but Hal and Falstaff, Kind of say, let's do something. And Falstaff's going to act like the king, Hal's father. And Hal's going to come before him. And so he sits on his throne uh, right after 374. And Falstaff sits up there. The prince comes up. And Falstaff says, 394 and following. Harry, I do not only marvel where thou spendest thy time, but also how thou art accompanied. For though the chamomile, the more it is trodden on, the faster it grows, yet youth, the more it is wasted, the sooner it wears. Thou art That thou art my son, I have partly thy mother's word. Notice that. I'm not sure you're my son, but she says you are. Partly my own opinion, but chiefly a villainous trick of thine eye and a foolish hanging of thy nether lip that doth warrant me. If then thou be son to me, here lies the point. Why, being son to me, art thou so pointed at? That is, people are pointing at you all the... He's talking about, you're in people's eyes. How? Going in and out of the taverns and such. Shall the blessed son of heaven prove a mitcher and eat blackberries? A question not to be asked. Shall the son of England prove a thief and take purses? Well, isn't that what Rich Henry was saying? 5-3 Richard II? There is a thing, Harry, which thou hast often heard of, and it is known to many in our land by the name of pitch. Tar from trees, for example. This pitch, as ancient writers do report, doth defile, so doth the company thou keepest. Now keep in mind, this is Falstaff pretending to be Henry IV. Does a pretty good job, actually, because we're going to see Henry IV have an interview with Prince Hal that's going to be very similar to this. Right? For Harry, now I do not speak to thee in drink, but in tears, not in pleasure, but in passion, not in words, only but in woes also. And yet there is, there is a virtuous man whom I've often noted in thy company, but I know not his name. So who is Falstaff slash Henry IV talking about? Not the virtuous man, but the others. Quans, Peto, Bardolph. 
we later missed as quickly and, and others. So, Prince, what manner of man? And like, who? Who is this man? What's he look like? A goodly, portly man in faith. Goodly, portly man. Uh, in the Harry Potter novels, Aunt Marge tells Dudley, you know, he's a good shape. You'll be a right sized man like your father. Only problem is Dudley, if I remember correctly, is described in that book as the size of a baby killer whale. He's grossly obese. When Falstaff says a goodly, portly man, he means you're a good size. The problem is he is almost too fat to move. Okay? And a corpulent, of a cheerful look, a pleasing eye, and a most noble carriage. If you read the... Yes? So he's saying the prince is big? No. He's big. Falstaff slash playing the part of Henry IV is saying that virtuous old man that you hang around with is. Oh, okay. So he's talking about himself. This is, the character is based on this guy named Sir John Oldcastle. Real knight. And his descendants apparently had issues with Shakespeare creating Falstaff based on him. Okay? So, notice noble carriage, he's some 50 or by your lady inclining to three scores, so he's between 50 and 60 years old, and his name is Falstaff. If that man should be lewdly given, he deceiveth me. That is, if he's given to lewd actions, then boy, he tricked me. I would never imagine that. For Harry, I see virtue in his looks. If then the tree may be known by the fruit, <clears throat> as the fruit by the tree, then peremptorily I speak it, there is virtue in that Falstaff. Him keep with, the rest banish. So, when you become king, keep him with you, but banish all the others. Dost thou speak like a king? Do thou stand? You stand for me and I'll play my father. Okay, so let's reverse this now. Henry says, depose me? Whoa. In other words, wow, you are like your father, aren't you? Just in this little mock play. If thou dost it half so gravely, so majestically, both in word and matter, hang me up by my heels for the rabbit sucker or a poulter's hair. Prince, here I am set, Falstaff, and here I stand. Judge, my masters. Now, there's a very famous biography written of Martin Luther. The one who started the Protestant Reformation, 1517. Titled, Here I Stand. Because that, apparently, is what... We haven't talked about this. Let's come up with Hamlet. Because that, apparently, is what Luther said At the Diet of Worms in 1521. Diet of Worms, Diet there means convocation, meeting. Okay? Holy Roman Emperor called a meeting. Yeah, I need to do it. <laughs> Back up. 1517, 1031. Anybody know what happened? Halloween, October 31st. Martin Luther nailed. Have I talked about this before? I mean, you just know it already. If you know it already, I'm impressed, because usually nobody knows it. He nailed the 95 Theses to the church door in Wittenberg. Okay? This all comes out in Hamlet, because Hamlet's a student in Wittenberg, and the Diet of Worms is mentioned. So he nails the 95 Theses to the church door in Wittenberg. Why? What's a thesis? It's an argument. Every one of you is going to write a paper here. It damn well better have a thesis. Okay? If you're going to write a paper. It's, a, it's an argument. Okay? He had 95 points of disputation. Points to argue. These were not 95 reasons why the, why the Roman Catholic Church needs to be broken up and we need to start this thing called the Protestant Church, the protesting church. No. These were 95 problems that he wanted to clean up. 
clarify. For example, indulgences. Okay? There's a guy named Johannes Tetzel, who was an indulgence seller. And he would go around from one place to another. He had permission to sell indulgences in a certain place. And he'd say, whenever a coin in the coffer clinks, a soul from purgatory springs. Because he was buying and selling indulgences, not only for selling them to people for themselves, but selling them so that if I had a loved one who died and I thought was in purgatory, I could buy an indulgence to buy them time out of purgatory. An indulgence was simply a piece of paper issued by the Pope, papal stamp on it, that said, this gets you a certain amount of time out of purgatory. You could buy indulgences for varying amounts, varying amounts of money, for varying amounts of time in purgatory. And this is the part that really angered Luther. You could get indulgences for crimes slash sins you hadn't yet committed. Can you be repentant for something you've not yet done? So, average rabid red-blooded German male sees a beautiful woman docking, walking down the street and he thinks, I'm going to rape her. Buys an indulgence, rapes her, dies, not in the act, but later, dies, goes to purgatory and kind of goes, you don't get a hold this one against me. This one frees me from that sin. That's just one example of the things Luther thought was wrong. So, nobody takes him up on an offer. The local hierarchs of the church don't come and debate him. So he spends the next four years continually writing stuff, writing pamphlets and such. And in 1521, the Holy Roman Emperor invites him to a meeting, the Diet of Worms, at which the Holy Roman Emperor will be there in the church hierarchy. Not the Pope, but cardinals, archbishops, and such. And Luther agrees to go on a couple of conditions. One, I have to be granted safe passage. On my journey there, while there, I won't be arrested, and I have to be allowed to leave in safe passage home. Got it. Okay. Luther thinks he's finally going to get to debate. He's going to get to argue the things he wants to argue. He gets there, and everything he's written is stacked on a table. And he's told to do one thing. Recant. Take it all back. Say, I was wrong. Luther, being the good monk that, well, ex-monk that he was, said, you got to give me 24 hours to pray. Comes back the next morning, stands next to that pile of books, and said, unless proven to me by Holy Scripture, by my conscience... Or by logic, here I stand, I can do no other. That is, I stand with everything I wrote here. I was right. Okay? He given free passage, he leaves, and the Protestant Reformation you know, takes off. Okay? So, Falstaff, here I stand. I think Shakespeare is using that intentionally. Okay? So, the prince is now... Henry V, Henry IV, playing his father. Now, Harry, whence come you? And I never thought about that before, but that could also be another a parallel. That could be a biblical parallel. I'd have to look at the Geneva Bible. King James Bible wasn't published yet, so you can't go by the King James to see what Shakespeare would have worked from. You have to go by the Douay Reims or the Geneva Bible, the Great Bible. Um, the opening of the book of Job. God's in heaven and the sons of God come before him and he says to Satan, Whence come you? And Satan says, Prowling the earth, etc., etc. So, whence come you? My noble lord from East Cheap. You know, East Cheap, okay, that's East Cheap Street. 
Cheap there is from the Old English cap, which means goods, products. Cheap side was the street you'd go to to buy stuff. Okay? Doesn't have its modern meaning of inexpensive, um, poorly made kind of a thing. Okay? So, East Cheap, however, was where flesh was bought and sold. That's where the hookers were. So, the complaints I hear of thee are grievous. This is Hal pretending to be his father. You blood, my lord, they are false. Now I'll tickle you for a young prince in faith. Swearest thou, ungracious boy? Henceforth ne'er look on me. Thou art violently carried away from grace. There is a devil haunts thee in the likeness of an old fat man, a ton of man. Ton, not 2,000 pounds, but ton like beer cask. Or like a Jack Daniels cask, if you've seen those. Big, fat, round guy is thy companion. Why dost thou converse with that trunk of humors, that bolting hutch of beastliness, that swollen parcel of dropsies, that huge bombard of sack, that stuffed cloak bag of guts, that roasted manning tree ox with the pudding in his belly, that reverend vice? I mean, notice, how's just kind of pulling all the stops out here? Okay. He says... Wherein is he good but to taste sack and drink it? Wherein neat and cleanly but to carve a cape on and eat it? Wherein cunning but in craft? Wherein crafty but in villainy? Wherein villainous but in all things? Wherein worthy but in nothing? I would your grace would take me with you. Well, we means your grace. In other words, don't know who you're talking about. That villainous, abominable misleader of youth, Falstaff, that old, white, bearded, Satan. What does the name Satan literally mean? Adversary. Who's he the adversary of? Not Hal. The king. My lord, the man I know, I know thou dost. But to say I know more harm in him than in myself were to say more than I know. That he is old, more the pity. His white hairs do witness it. But that he is saving your reverence, a whore master, I utterly deny. If sack and sugar be a fault, God help the wicked. Okay? One of those two Shakespeare's, he's on tenuous ground. Why? Queen Elizabeth loved sugar. Her teeth were rotted from it. Keep in mind, it's fairly new. It's like the iPhone 10 SX whatever, you know, for their day. So he goes on, Falstaff does. If to be fat, to be hated, then Pharaoh's lean kind are to be loved. No, my good lord. Banish Pedo, banish Bardolph, banish Pons. But for sweet Jack Falstaff, kind Jack Falstaff, true Jack Falstaff, valiant Jack Falstaff, and therefore more valiant, being as he is Jack, old Jack Falstaff, banish not him, thy Harry's company. Banish not him, thy Harry's company. He says it twice. Foreshadowing. Yeah, it's exactly what it is. Because keep in mind, this is Falstaff pretending to be Harry, speaking to Harry pretending to be the king. And now look how he, how he ends it. Banish plump Jack and banish all the world. I do, I will. Now is Harry there speaking as Harry? Henry the Fourth? Or when he will be Henry the Fifth? Bardolph comes in. We get Act 3, Scene 1. Tell you what. Since we've only got two minutes, we'll just stop there. So we made a pretty good dent. Um, yeah, we'll finish this on Tuesday, I think.